So we often have the question, what makes a good therapist? But I want to ask a different question. What makes a good client? Having worked with people for over 20 years, I think there are certain people who, quite frankly, they show up, they have a mindset, they have a way of thinking about the change that we're about to do in a way that's really gonna help them have the result. I got really fascinated with this question and I hopped on with a good friend of mine. He's also a change worker. He's been doing this for over 20 years. Informally, he's uh, almost like a mentor to me. He's someone I greatly respect. He's over in Norway. He's a guy called Jürgen Rasmussen. And by the way, he also has his own YouTube channel, Provocative Hypnosis. If you're not following it, go over, check it out and click the link on there. But we hopped on and we had a chat, sharing some stories, sharing some ideas and the themes of what makes a good client? What's the attitude that they could show, the mindset that they should come with that's likely to give them the best results? But also, what are the alarm bells? What are the things that we might hear? They might say, they might present that makes us think, holy, this, they are not ready for this, or this is going to be a nightmare. By the way, quick aside for those of you who are new to the channel, my name's Howard Cooper. I've been working with people, therapeutically speaking, for almost 20 years now, helping them to make all sorts of positive changes. And what this channel is about is about sharing anxiety beating tips and psychological hacks, essentially from a mindset perspective, the difference that makes the difference. If that's the sort of content you're interested in, then click subscribe and hit the bell so you'll be notified when the new content comes out. Now over to the conversation. What can clients do to increase the chances of having success? Like how can they show up in a way that's going to help? And by the way, just so you know, Jürgen, I did a, a YouTube video about a month and a half ago, two months ago, uh, entitled, Can You Fix Me? Where I talked about the fact that no, no, it, I can't. It's not my job to fix people. So I think it'd be really good to hear, you know, some more in-depth stuff around what can people do? to increase those chances. Yeah, it's so fascinating that that's not a more discussed topic. I mean, if you look at all the, you know, the articles and the discussions that people have on various forms of therapy and coaching, you know, like what works best? Does this method work better than this method? You know, is, is, is this technique better than that technique? And virtually no one asks, you know, well, how about the successful clients? Mm -hmm. What do they have in common? What, what are the common denominators there? And a lot of people just have this idea that, that going to see someone like us is a bit like going to the dentist, where your contribution is essentially just to show up and lean back in the chair and open your mouth, mm -hmm. you know, or, or to just roll the car into the car shop and you, 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 get, you get fixed. And... Um, I've, I've noticed, I don't know about you, but I've, I've noticed a couple of things. One thing seems to be the people who have really made a decision, you know, the, the, the people who call and say, look, you know, like, I really got to deal with this. Like, like enough is enough. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Those are way more often than not the people who get done early. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think the commitment to change like I often say to clients, I don't really care how motivated you are because motivation is more of a state. It's going to come and go. You know, one day you might feel very motivated. And the next day you might not. A bit like exercise. One day you may be very motivated to go to the gym. The next day you'd rather stay in. But people who exercise on a regular basis, they don't rely on motivation. They have a commitment. They, they have a commitment and they have a routine. So, so I think that's the first thing. And the second one, I think, is almost everyone, when they come in and they talk about their particular issue, are going to point their finger outwards and say, you know, it's the mother-in-law. That's a good candidate often. You no, know, but that, just to stop you, that one's true, right? Yeah, that, that one actually is true. Okay. Uh, it's it's my childhood, you know, or, or, or when she says that, or when that happens, I have these feelings. When people are willing, ready, and able to begin to take that same finger and point it inwards and begin to look at, wait a minute, how am I making meaning? Mm -hmm. How am I making sense of this? You know, what's my story? Yeah. What's my contribution here? How am I part of this? 
the, the moment people are willing to orient in that direction, change most usually occurs. And, and when people aren't, it's, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it's, it's, it's rougher, you know, and that's why often people say, yeah, I want the hypnosis to fix me versus how can I kind of apply that to make this yeah. change happen? I think the distinctions you make as well in the phrase ready, willing, and able are interesting because people are ready a lot of the time. Well, they think they're ready, but but really aren't willing. That They are two entirely different things. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I, I mean, I understand what, where you're coming from in terms of that idea of enough is enough. They reach that place. But do you find that there is a place where it transitions and moves into an unhelpful desperation, like enough is enough. And I'm so in that space that you have to fix me. I'm now so desperate. I, you know, have you had that, that, you know, uh, I often have this, the whole, you're yeah. my last hope. E even though I strongly suspect that most of those people have not really reached a point where they've decided to make a change. Mm-hmm. Because I don't know about you, but, but this is something I've discovered over the years. When someone calls late on a Sunday night, you know, or, or like outside of office hours, and they're crying on the phone, and they're telling their story, and you can hardly get a word in, right? Mm -hmm. and, and if you try to ask them any like productive questions, as in what they're looking to get out of the session, or... Or, or, or you try to set any frames, they just go back to telling their story. Like they're just back to, and, and if, if only you can help me, if only I could get a little bit of relief, like I'm willing to do anything. Those are the first people to either do a no-show or to send an SMS the night before or to, yeah, you know, something got in the way. Mm -hmm. like, like the people who complain the most and who are most invested in telling their story are the first to balk at price, not do their homework tasks, not show up, or, or, or wanting to move their appointments around at the last minute because of some inconvenience. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going on there? I think these folks are very often using their problem as a way of maintaining their identity and as a way of being significant. Mm -hmm. Like, like they're, they're often getting a lot of mileage out of being the one with the big problem that never gets solved. And they, mm -hmm. they, they get virtue and status by often being the one that's unhelpable or who is suffering more than anyone else. Yeah, I'm not saying that this is true in all cases, but I, 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 I do think that quite often, you know, uh, like everyone's looking to be significant in some way in their life and to have some sort of meaning and to have a, you know, some sort of identity. And, and I think for some people, um, having the big issue that never gets sold or being the one who's suffering more than anyone who becomes some people's way of being significant and being important. Well, I, I've had those people that you get the sense that they say to you the story of, I've seen this therapist and that therapist and the other therapist. It's like, you know, uh, you know, you see here about serial killers notching their arm. Yeah. You know, like I've killed another, you know, uh, and they're chalking up therapists that they go through so that they can reinforce. I'm, I'm coming to see you, subtext being, so that I can just, again, reaffirm I am unfixable. Yeah. I, I, I had a client who literally said that once. Like, like wow. I've been to see this person, that person, that person, that person. They all failed miserably. And mm -hmm. now I'm coming to see you. And I was like, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> not on those terms, you're not. Well, I, I remember years ago, I remember seeing a, uh, someone who came to, for stopping smoking. And I'd had a chat with them all ahead of time and said, listen, I don't see people unless... They really want to stop themselves. You know, yeah. if this is someone else wants you to stop, it's not, not for me. And he assured yeah. me he wanted to do it. And then he turns up for the session. And I said, remind me, why do you want to stop? And he was like, I don't, but my wife told me to come. And yeah. I said, but why did you tell me? He said, you know, he said, well, you said that you wouldn't see me if I told you the other thing. So I lied so that you'd see me. 
Yeah. And I just thought, oh, God. Um, well, like, he's here now. Let's just see what happens. Um, looking back, I probably shouldn't have done that. I should have ended it at that moment. But he was there. He would paid. So we did this session. And at the end, I, it was amazing. He goes, right. He says, I'm going to go outside now and see if I can smoke. Because right. I want to see if what you do works. Right. And I went, well, I can save you the effort. You can. Like, you will be able to. Yeah. And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, here's what we'll do. And I, I love this. It's just balmy. He goes, I'm going to go and see if I can smoke. And if I can, I'll come back and see you again. Yeah. And if that, if you still can't help me, I'll just stop myself. And I went, well, why, why don't you just stop yourself and save yourself the time and the money? Yeah. But it, it just struck me as bizarre. The, 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 the intent but, was to but, see, could, could I help him? Oh, yes. But, 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 but you, you get a way more virtue out of it if all these therapists failed and then I had to do it myself. Absolutely. So yeah. It's, it's like the hero's journey. I, I think another factor here, too, is th that people often don't look at. And, and that is that having a big problem or, or having an overwhelming symptom is often also a way of, of making one's life or social relationships be more stable. Like if I'm, if I'm deeply depressed, that there are unwritten social rules mm -hmm. for how to deal with someone who's deeply depressing. And a lot of people might just take off like, like they, they, they no longer come around, but the people who do come around will often have a tendency to, to treat me the way that our society currently says that we should treat. I, I, I get stability. I, I get a sense of control, mm -hmm. you know? So, so I, I think that might be going on and, and I, I don't like the term secondary gain that much. I, I more like the term competing commitments. Mm -hmm. Like, like we humans are obviously complex in that we, we can have competing commitments and, and multiple motivations in doing the same thing. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a bit like, you know, sometimes if I work with a person who's, who's bitter and resentful, you know, they, they've done everything for other people always. They, they put everyone needs first, you know, ahead of their own and, and, and now they're not getting the attention that they deserve or whatever it might be. Some of these people, you know, some of this might be driven by kindness and a good heart and a compassion. I'm, I'm not knocking that. No. And I also often say to them, and I wonder how much of this might be driven by something like if I only become perfect and altruistic enough and kind enough and a good enough person who sacrifices for the others, then they will accept and love me and then I'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And I've never failed to get a strong like response from these people. And I go, well, if yeah. that's the case, then that's also part of the motivation. Like, like there, there, there is a self-centered motivation here too. Nothing wrong with that, but, but there are easier ways of doing that than playing the marcher game. Yeah. So, and, 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 and one doesn't exclude the other. There might be a strong element of that. And it might also be a strong element of just wanting the best for someone. It, it, it can be both. Yeah. So I, I think that while some people may have some strong desire for change there might also be a you know if if i resist i get to be right yeah if if i suddenly change this then that means that i was faking it or what the other person did was okay or i'll never forget this this was very early in my career i i took a woman who had been claustrophobic for i think it was 12 years to a hotel and we went into the elevator together which is something that she had said she would never do right mm -hmm. she looks at me with this kind of funny look that i couldn't quite identify as what's going on with her and i looked at her and i said are you okay well, what's going on for you and she says no i'm not 
But, but she, she was kind of assertive. She didn't seem scared. Like she did not look the way people who I've spent time with in elevators who have been scared looked. And I said, well, are you scared? And she said, no, not at all. And I was like, well, what? And then she started crying and said, my entire life has revolved around this for the last 12 years. What on earth am I going to do now? Yeah. And it, to, to many people, that might sound so silly. And so, but it's, it's, there's something to it sometimes. So go, going back to the, <clears throat> the initial starting question, uh, which is about how can you succeed as a client? I'm curious to share from both our points of view, what are the alarm bells that people say when they first reach out that make you think, holy shit, this person is not in the right frame of mind or in, in, a, in a place that's going to lend itself to change? What are the things, therapeutically speaking, that we listen out for? Yeah, I, I, I think for me, uh, a strong sense of entitlement and, and a lack of, of social cues. Mm -hmm. So, so for example, someone who calls you at an unreasonable hour, 11 o'clock on Sunday night. Now, there might be exceptions. There, there, there might be people who, who, who are just in an acute crisis, and they do. And th th there might be a time and place for that. But most of the people who do that, in my experience, are not in an acute crisis. They're, they're just so entitled and, and, and so immature in a sense that, that the idea that it's night and that someone might, might have a life, you know, like outside of them, it doesn't even occur to them. The, yeah. the world should just be at their call. And I, I've, I've spoken to people like that, you know, who in a week later, they don't even remember who you are. Mm -hmm. Because they've spoken to a lot of people and they, 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 so that sense of entitlement, um, pe people who just immediately go into telling their story, like they don't even introduce themselves. They, they, they just tell their story and you, you can hear that they've told it a thousand times. Yeah. <clears throat> They're just on this program. And if I try to interject or, or, ask some questions and they don't at all answer them. They just go right back into the telling their story. Like if I try that a few times and they just go back to their story, that's the person who's, who's, who's going to, you know, yeah. not do anything, not really commit. They, they just want to tell their story. Like, like they're, they're looking for their supply. So uh, the, the way I think about it is, are they willing to let me control the, that, that initial call? Are they, yeah. are they willing for me to be a part of this? Uh, and I'll give you a good example of this. I remember someone rang me up and they were just like, how much do you charge? Yeah. I was like, well, just, just let's hold on a second. Let, let's just tell me what's going on for you. And then I can explain more about how we work and let's just see if there's a good fit. You know, yeah. no, just tell me how much is it? And already I'm thinking to myself, if you can't play the game of, of going through the process in the right way, and this is just an initial call. Yeah. How on earth is he going to follow instructions for 90 minutes or, or, or yeah. allow me to, to be the leader in, in this? Yes. yes. Help him to see something new. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I just had that the other day. I, I, I had a, a, a woman send me an email of, of you know, jealousy issues. Mm -hmm. And she was like, yeah, you, you can just send me some information on email and I can kind of evaluate. Mm -hmm. I, 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 sent her, I, I sent her back. I always start with a conversation because I have a lot of questions for you as well for yeah. us to determine whether we might be a good fit. I always wonder what they think you're going to send back. It's like a price list. It's like, ah, jealousy, jealousy, 25 pounds. Some, some, some people, and you know, some people are just, they, they just impulsively make a call. Mm. And they might have called five people and if you call them back, you know, like, like they leave a text message to call them back, right? They don't even know who you are. Yeah. Like, like, like they're so, it's, it's, it's so clear that they don't view themselves as active participants. They, they, they have no idea that, that they're going to have to offer something of themselves mm -hmm. in the interaction. They're just kind of price shopping. Where, where are you located? How much does it cost? 
And I usually tell to these people, I'm way too far away and too expensive. <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's my response. And some people start laughing and some people get offended. Mm-hmm. I, I say to them, look, if, if your main criteria is to just find someone who will offer to work as cheaply as possible and be as convenient as possible, I'm not your guy. Yeah. But be, 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 because e, e, even if you want to be nice, like even if you want to be nice and and take these people on, they're gonna they're gonna book your time, and, and then they're gonna you know send you an SMS the night before you know wasting your time because they found someone who was willing to work cheaper or yeah. for free. There, 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 like 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 there's there, there's no there's no. Um, How about this one? And uh, this just popped up in my head. The people who go, is there a money back guarantee? That that always for me is an alarm bell. Of they are not thinking. Yeah, they they really think that the onus is on me to do it all for what them. I'm, what I'm what I'm what I think is important to distinguish though is, you know, I've had people who like they they just call up and is like, how much does it cost and this and that and and I'll say to them, look, if if that is like I'll tell you, but but if that is your main criteria, I'm not your guy. Mm. however if you're just asking the question because you kind of don't know what else to ask we can have a conversation and see if we're a good fit and some people go yeah yeah you know they 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 just don't know how to have the conversation they they don't really so so so, sometimes people ask these sorts of questions out of ignorance and and they're not really thinking clearly And, and then you have other people who just have that mindset they, 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 they just, it's like, they, they, cause I, I tell people, I say to them, look, this is not like going to the dentist. It's not a surgery. This is a do with process. And I say to them, look, what I bring to the table in terms of competency, experience, knowledge matters. What you bring to the table in terms of commitment, in terms of uh, ability to concentrate, uh, ability to 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 listen, you know, learn. These things really matter, and our relationship matters. So th- this is a do with process where we both are going to have very active parts. Mm-hmm. Some people, when I spell that out, like it and they get it and they change their orientation, and then other people just don't hear a word of it. And 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 they go back to their back to their stuff. And I I think there's also, I mean, we we are also human beings. Uh, you know, we're gonna have our personal preferences. We're we're gonna like some clients more than others. And while we may always be professional, we are likely to put more effort in and go the extra mile with someone who with someone we like and resonate with. So one tip to people seeking coaching, change work therapy is don't be a prick. Like treat the person you're looking to solicit help from in a respectful way. Mm -hmm. Meaning don't call them in the middle of the night. Don't, you know, um, pay, pay your actual fees on time, you know, don't don't postpone appointments on the same day because you want to do some extra work and then expect that that's okay. Yeah. Like, like, like be an adult, be likable. Yeah. It, it, it's a bit like Frank Ferrelli used to, you know, this provocative therapy guy, you know, he, he used to work like this. And I, I do some, I do too sometimes, but I mean, I've had clients come in and they say, oh, nobody likes me. You know, I say, well, I don't know if I like you either. Like, is there any reason to? Because you're mostly complaining and you're, 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 you're mostly, you know, what is there to like? And, and sometimes it's said as a challenge or with a sense of humor. Mm-hmm. But I think sometimes you have adults who act like children and some of them operate that way and some of them operate that way almost because they think they should. Yeah. And, and they might have seen therapists and coaches who, who have kind of reinforced that victim 
narrative. Um, yeah, agreed. I just think clarity is king. And, and like everything else, I would say to any potential client, whether they're seeing us or anyone else, is do your homework. Get clear on what you want. Research. Yeah. T- like whenever someone calls and they say, I'm a skeptic, I'll, I'll, I'll say to them, so I assume that you've really done your homework then on me. Like you've gone through the web page, you've read relevant literature, you, and they always get really quiet. Like, no, no, I, I, I just kind of read a few. It's like, what, what's, what's your skepticism based in? What, what's your, like, like invest don't necessarily invest economically but before you have good information, but invest some time, some energy in looking into. Yeah. Get clear on what you want. Get clear on what the other person is is actually offering, and if mm-hmm. this is something you're willing to to engage with. Well, I, I think that's hugely valuable uh, advice, and also reminds me. You know, I've had people who mandate how I'm supposed to work with them. Yes. That that's an interesting one where they ring me up and they go, I, I, I'm just ringing because you need to um, regress me back to the root cause. Or I had someone that said, it's uh, I've been told my problem comes from my past life and you need to take me back to my past life. And, and when I suggest that I, I'm happy to work with them to help them achieve peace of mind, but I, I, I can't be held to ransom over the particular method and approach. I, I'm going to do yeah. what I'm going to do to help them. Yeah, um, they they don't want that. No, no, I know what I need. And I think I think for if anyone who is in our profession is listening to this too, I think it's an invitation for them as well to get clear on what you're doing, what you're offering, what your terms are. Yeah. And, and and to be willing to to take leadership to to be like I do with clients, I say, look, this is going to be your role. This is going to be my role. This is how these sessions work. And I, I really lay that out for them. And some people, not for them, and that's fine. And most people are, yeah, you know that that sounds good. But I think a lot of people in this industry too are very wishy washy and trying to be everything for everyone and. Yeah, they, they don't necessarily step up to the plate and show any leadership or or are not necessarily clear on their frames either. They might advertise that hypnosis can do this and this for you and fix you in that and that way. And if they do that, it's no wonder that they then get clients who want that. Indeed. Like, do it to me. And, do it uh, to me, yes. Do, do, do it to me, baby. Do, do, Fix me. So, so this whole, I, I say this to almost everyone. I say, look, be very clear. This is not a do-to process. It's a do-with process. We are both yep. active participants. And I, I, I make sure to really emphasize it. Yeah. Uh, so, so that the person, and sometimes I might say to people, you know, if I sense some of the stuff I previously mentioned, I said, look, when you're with me, you're an adult. I'm, I'm going to treat you as an adult. I'm not going to treat you as a victim or, or, or a person who's sick or a person who's like, I'm going to be an adult. You're going to be an adult. And, yeah. it's, and, and, and for some people, that just provokes the hell out of them. Yeah, I had, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. please. I, I had, a, I had a, a client not long ago who who I was going to see her, I think, at 2 o'clock. And then she sent me an SMS at, I don't know, like 10 o'clock. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just going to work overtime today. And if she could just get a different appointment, this and that. And I, I wrote back and I said, well, yes, you can book a new appointment, but it's going to be on your tab. And she freaked and this may also have been me not doing a well enough job. Like I shouldn't have accepted this person to begin with because the red flags were there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you, but, you know, t- to me, that's not being an adult. Like ha- had this been a person who has said, you know, my, my son has been in an accident. I have to go to the hospital. Fine. You know, or, or I just got sick or, or 
no problem. But 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 if someone if someone doesn't even call and it's like, yeah, I'm just going to choose to put in some extra work. You know, I'm going to do this today. You know, can you just and, and and they don't even see that. But but this is his job. This is how they make a living. You know, this am I really expecting the person who is helping me to pick up that tab? Like that's a teenage daughter. It's not an adult woman age 30. Like like. Mm-hmm that sense of of entitlement uh that some people some people have uh and and i think with some people it it is encouraged in therapy settings because they're they're treated as if they're ill and they can't help anything and and they're the victim so how dare you suggest that they're accountable and that they show up on time and that they pay their bill when they're supposed to and these sorts of things. Well, it kind of reminds me that one of, one of the things that I do on, a, on an initial call, if ever I'm speaking to someone, is I will deliberately prod and poke and joke and jest with them because I want to get a measure of how they respond to that. And I, yeah. uh, for me, alarm bells do go off if they have zero sense of humor at all and or they get very offended quickly or whatever but for me that's just a it's there's unlikely to be a good fit yeah I, know, I, so in many ways I, i'm doing them a service i very i, I very often did the old bandler thing <clears throat> where mm-hmm. someone would, would call and say do you work with anxiety and i would say nah i work better without i usually work in a state of calm <laughs> and of course some people crack up laughing and some people get really offended like mm-hmm. they get offended by that you just personally insulted them. Yeah. That's, that's. Well, because what they're looking for is, is for someone to take their problem very seriously because they equate, if someone takes the problem seriously, then that will help. But, but of course, the logic doesn't flow. In many ways, what they need is someone not to take their problem seriously, or, or in other words, to help them not take their problem as seriously. And yeah, ruminate on it as much because, because for, for some of these people, it equals taking them as human beings seriously because that's their identity. Yeah, that's that's who they are. I, I have a fun story about this. I, I I saw a client. This is probably twenty years ago too, who came in deeply depressed. She had moved to the city that I live in, and she'd just been frustrated, mm-hmm. a bit lonely, frustrated. She went to see a psychiatrist who had essentially badgered her into accepting that she was depressed. She, this is something I discovered later when I spoke to her, but, but the, the psychiatrist was like, you're depressed. And she was like, no, I'm just frustrated. I am the psychiatrist and you're depressed. There's plenty of young people who are depressed without knowing it. And she was like, well, <laughs> he probably knows what he's talking about. I am depressed then. And lo and behold, after that, she really went into a pretty good depression. And then she was put into this group with other depressed people. And they were like mm-hmm. depressing, you know, this come to think of it. She actually told me this during the session. And she told me this story. And and I have this old like, how do you do your depression thing? And she's like, well, I, I wake up, I look into the ceiling, I realize that there's nothing going on. And it's just like, I started belly laughing. I, I started laughing hysterically. It, it was an involuntary response. I, I just found the whole thing hysterically funny she got so offended she got so offended that she essentially said fuck you and left the office you know it was like really really and then a few months later i I got a call and she was like well thank you for changing my life and and i i didn't even recognize initially and, and and is she joking is she and she said look this is what happened I went to you, <laughs> you started laughing. I was so angry. I wanted to strangle you. And she said, but after a few days, it, it kind of dawned on me. She said, because I respected you and I knew you had helped someone I really cared for. So I knew you. <clears throat> and it just dawned on her that if he, as a skilled, competent professional, is not at all taking this seriously and just finding the whole thing hilarious, Maybe my issues aren't that serious. And, and that kind of popped her out of it. And, and she ended up agreeing that the whole thing was kind of hilarious. And yeah. she, 
she stopped her depression group. She went back to work. She got new friends. Life moved on. And she essentially realized that she'd been conned into this depression thing, you know, by the psychiatrist. It Such was hilarious, you know. Yeah. Such but, but, a great story. I love that. I yeah, absolutely but, love that. But, but it, it's like with everything else, I think it's important to point out is that change work can be extremely forgiving and it can be extremely predictable. So, I mean, I'm sure that both you and I have plenty of counterexamples to what we have just said. Like oh. it's, it's, it's the old uh, cameraman phenomena at a hypnosis or NLP course where you have some guy who's smoking or he's, he has an allergy or whatever it might be. And he's just watching the demos. Mm -hmm. He has no commitment. He, he, he has no, but something resonates and he finds himself after watching that. I never smoked again. Mm -hmm. I remember listening to a guy saying who had been the cameraman who said, I still wanted to smoke, but my body just wouldn't have it. Like, like they just made the change. Well, sometimes people do, like I remember this other guy who I helped with anxiety once who a few years later, he, he said, I, I, I need a tune-up session. I need to, he said, I need to see you. I was like, fine. And this was in the middle of winter. And he came to the office a, a couple of days, like he missed the date. Mm -hmm. That was shoveling snow because I was getting ready for another client. And I said, dude, it's, it's on Thursday. And he was like, ah, ah. But but that was it. Like he, he said, as soon as I saw you, I knew everything was going to be okay. And, and that was it. <laughs> I have no magical powers, but but the way mine worked. He'd created that meaning uh, and that link. Um, <clears throat> I, I had a, just to remind me, this, this young lad, um, I think he was autistic or had Asperger's. Um, his mum wanted him to come and see me and we'd had a little chat and I said, listen, unless he wants to come, there's really no point in, in whatever, in him coming to see me. And she rings me and said, no, no, he says he's agreed to meet you. He's agreed to meet you. And he says he'll meet you with a, with a positive frame of mind. Yeah. Are you sure? So they, they book a session, they come three hours on a train to come and see me. Uh, and, and they walk in and he says, hello. And I said, hi. I said, come and sit down. And he turns to his mum and he goes, I promised to meet him with a positive mind. I've just done that. <laughs> right. That was it. Yeah. 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 Kind of literal. No, no, very literal. I, and I, yes, unlike your story, I did not help him. It, yeah. it, it was, you know, he'd agreed to meet me and he had kept his end of the bargain. Have, have, you, have you noticed too? I mean, I, I've had this experience on many occasions where someone makes a dramatic change. And then, you know, they, they kind of credit, you know, you really helped me, you know, this and that. I said, mm -hmm. what was it that you discovered or learned or discovered? Like, what was it about our sessions that most deeply impacted you? Oh, yes, it was when you said that. And I'm like going, I never said that. Like, I, I, I never say anything remotely like that. But they've heard something that yeah. came home for them. I, I think that's a key takeaway that it's, it's what the other person hears. It's what the other person discovers, which is why Milton Erickson was right, where he said, look, what we do is we provide the weather. We create the learning context in an artistic way and offer experiments and tools. But yeah. it's always what the client hears and discovers or uncovers in themselves that actually generates the change. That's a hundred percent. I totally agree. And thank you so much for coming and, and sharing some of this. I always love shooting the breeze with you and I'd love to have you come back uh, on the channel as well and, uh, and chat some more about this, but uh, we always have such fun. And uh, if anyone, uh, maybe I'll put the outtakes on, but Jürgen and I can't ever start any interview or conversation when we've done this so many times now without yeah, just calling that laughing for about five minutes. <laughs> oh no, no, don't start this again. So I'm here with my good friend Jürgen Rasmussen and uh, let, before we dive in on what I think was going to be a really interesting and valuable con... Versation. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't know why. It's become like it's become an anchor. 
uh, I think that, you know, we start to I say, right, let's start. And that's it. We both just lose it for about 10 minutes. So I really appreciate you tuning in. Hopefully you found it valuable. And if you have, it would be wonderful if you could comment, uh, share, like, subscribe, all of that stuff. That's the way that YouTube knows this was one that's worth sharing far and wide. Hope you enjoyed. See you all soon. Thank you.